All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. I'm Kathy Meacham, and I am joined today with Manoz Chetri, Patrick Byers, and Pong Tian. Um, if you are wondering who your horticulture specialist is, and um, here's the map that shows where we are across the state. We're always happy to get a call from anywhere, but uh, if you can call the horticulture specialist in your area, they'll be happy to help you out. Um, we've got a good program today as usual. We'll, uh, Pong has changed his name to ask questions here. So send any questions directly to him. And um, and we'll if we can get to the answer during the, uh, oh. during the garden hour, we will. If not, uh, give him your email address and someone will get back to you with that answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over now to Tony with the weather. Okay, thank you. Can somebody run my PowerPoint? Yes, I believe um, that's taken care of. Is that correct, Jared? Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm, I am out of the office again, this time in Lynn County at Linnaeus. And I've been talking to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders about weather safety today, which is fortuitous because they had a tornado come through here on Saturday night. So let's move to the next slide. And we'll see some of the, and bring up the two maps about the temperature. Yesterday we had across the northern part of the state and uh, touching 80 in Boone County and points south and west. Today, we're gonna see temperatures mainly in the mid 80s, as you can see. And next maps. This is yesterday's weather map, but they haven't been changing much day to day right now. And uh, the you see a series of weak frontal boundaries across the Plains states and just to our south. And those are touching off scattered showers and thunderstorms. But in general, just making life difficult for us to forecast. And uh, you can see that there's very moist air uh, to our south and in the southeast right now. Next. The flow pattern changed, all right? Last week we were talking about more meridional flow, more north-south flow, and that was what brought us the cold end of April, all right? The flow has switched and is more east to west across the United States now, and we have a very weak ridge in the middle of the country, uh, right where uh, Missouri and Iowa are, and that's gonna be our weather maker for the next few days. Next. Uh, once again, I like to review where we are precipitation wise. And you have 30 days worth of precip on the very far left. You can see that parts of the state have gotten decent amounts of rain, but that there's kind of like a little island in the middle of Missouri where we didn't get much of any precipitation during uh, the last 30 days. And the, the second map is the difference from normal. You can see that much of the state is below normal. And then on the very right, I have the new summer outlook. And we'll talk about that a little later, but it looks favorable according to that map. Next. This map I showed last week was just the March to 30th of April precip. Again, just to reinforce that we're short on precip. Next. Here's the drought conditions map. And you can see that, uh, you can see that we've gone from no drought in Missouri to a little more widespread abnormally dry conditions across much of the state. And we're even into severe drought for a little strip right in the middle of Missouri from about Pittsburgh, Kansas to Mexico, Missouri. And uh, that's been the biggest change in the last week. Next. Yeah. 
again, so far, if you consider March and April combined, you can see that we're pretty close to normal in Boone County with temperatures, but that precipitation was way below normal, four and a half inches below normal in Boone County. But in other parts of the state, the temperatures were closer to normal for uh, March and April, but they, there was a shortage of precipitation across the state, except for Cape Girardeau, which showed a little bit of a plus. Uh, and so far for the first part of May, we're running hot and below normal, just like we did in April. Next. Uh, what's changed in the last week? Not much, actually. The, the weather map looks fairly similar to last week. Uh, again, I got the early part of April on top but we just added seven days to the bottom map and it looks very similar to last week. Again, the difference being that now we're under a more east-west flow part of this uh, weather system rather than being in the trough like we were at the end of April. Next. And so it's showing up as the same as we had at the end of April is that uh, temperatures have been below normal. Although keep in mind that we did a pattern change around last weekend and that's gonna show up next in next week's discussion. Next. So far the pros, again, the models keep overselling us on precipitation. Uh, the models keep giving us hope that we're going to get a decent amount of precipitation. You can see that parts of Texas are expecting up to 10 and 12 inches of rain in the next uh, seven days. And that Missouri's even expecting some decent rains. But again, the models keep telling us it's coming. And then as we get to those days, it's not coming. My hope is that at some point, the models are going to hit it next. Here's the latest summer outlook uh, for June through August. And the latest summer outlook puts us in equal chances. Equal chances uh, you can interpret as close to normal, but what it really means is we don't know. On the right-hand side, you see the precipitation outlook for summer, which has wetness in the Ohio Valley region and wetness for us. I'll be curious to see how that changes in the next two weeks. This forecast was issued April 20th. So uh, another week or two, we'll see if there's been changes in this forecast. Because right now, it's the driest that it's been ever from March 25th to uh, May 5th statewide. And that's beating even 1936, which is scary. Next. Next 10 days, six to 10 days, showing a shift in the heat out west. And in some ways, this is resembling 2021. And 2021 summer was, uh, or maybe it was 2020. But there was a summer in the last two or three years where we did get decent precipitation and the heat was out west, although the six to 10 day outlook has us pretty dry. Next. The three to four week outlook, again, still pretty dry, but uh, equal chances in terms of temperature. Next. And we'll just go to the end and talk about the forecast. Yeah, go ahead and flip to the end with the forecast. Um, you know, there was a chance of showers and thunderstorms this afternoon across much of the state, I think. Uh, we'll see temperatures in the upper 70s north of 36, but below 80s elsewhere. Tonight, we'll see low to mid 60s of a chance of showers and thunderstorms. Again, this is going to be all hit and miss. Some of you may get it. Some of you may not. Thursday, rain and showers again, developing uh, west to east. 
temperatures in the upper 70s in northern places, but low 80s southeast. Friday, mixed clouds again with a chance of, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, chance of showers and thunderstorms in the lower 80s Friday night, but in the upper 60s Friday night. So um, Friday, actually, the model's peg is a better day for precip. So let's hope that they're right this time. Then Saturday, again, warm and humid in most places, a chance of showers and thunderstorms. But Sunday, we're looking to cool down. We're looking to cool down about 10 degrees with a chance of showers all day. And then the lows to drop down into the upper 50s Sunday night. Uh, Monday and Tuesday of next week, sunny. That's all I can say is sunny. Those two days look bright and but cool for this time of year. Low 70s uh, north to upper 70s south and temperatures as low as the upper 40s north to the mid 50s south. And soil temperatures are looking real good. So any questions for me on that or? Tony, I had a quick question. Uh, yes. Do you have any information on uh, flooding issues along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers relative to all that melted snow coming down our way? Yeah, I'm not sure where we're at now, but at least a few days ago, there was some flooding up uh, on the northern parts of the Mississippi River north of St. Louis uh, because of that melting snow. It had the uh, snow melted so quickly and there was so much of it that there was flooding and they did warn of it. Uh, does any, is, uh, I, I, if anybody wants to uh, know, you can go on to the National Weather Service or just email me and I'll get the latest on that. Thank you, Tony. Um, we appreciate you uh, joining us every week, and it's so important to uh, making gardening plans. And I will say I was in the miss category last night on the <laughs> hit and miss rain. I, I got missed. I was very surprised when I got up this morning, but thank yes. you again. So were we. We were in the miss. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. All right. Well, we're going to get right into questions. Patrick? You are muted. How embarrassing. <laughs> Not here. Well, thank you, Kathy. We're all. <laughs> um, so so I, I am Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist in Southwest Missouri and excited to be your moderator today on the questions. And, and I'll mention, as, as I think perhaps everyone knows, that uh, feel free to, to uh, send questions to the Garden Hour. You can also send questions in real time today that we'll tackle if we have time at the end of our, our uh, prepared questions. And we have several very interesting questions that have come in. And then we've supplemented that with uh, questions that uh, several of us have received at the extension offices across Missouri. All right, uh, the first question, squirrels, love them, hate them. I've resorted to having some potted plants with rocks covering the soil, using netting over the dirt, in and around the plants in mineral tubs. However, it's not always aesthetically pleasing to plant rocks with pretty flowering plants. Any ideas in dealing with the rats with bushy tails? And I think of all of Missouri's wildlife, perhaps squirrels, uh, uh, you know, cause, cause enough damage that we're all aware of that. And uh, I'll tackle that question. Uh, when we think about squirrels, uh, they are part of the, the native fauna of Missouri. They're found across the state. They're found obviously in urban and suburban areas as well as in rural areas, and sooner or later, there's going to be a conflict with most gardeners and squirrels. Now they can feed on crops such as tomatoes and, and um, corn. Uh, they can also dig up those spring flowering bulbs and also seeds to cause damage that way. If you're a nut grower, I'm sure you've dealt with, with the damage squirrels can do to walnut and pecan crops. And they can also chew on, on uh, the buds and developing shoots on evergreens and trees and and other plants in our landscapes. And then when you add to that, the fact that like most rodents, their teeth continue to grow and they have to chew to wear them down, the damage they can do to decking, siding, um, uh, roofing. And also if they ever get into your attic, they can wreak havoc in that area there. So 
definitely squirrels are of concern. Now, here in Missouri, the regulation of wildlife is under the, the, uh, uh, regu the, the purview of the Missouri Department of Conservation. And I did a quick check of the wildlife code of Missouri. And both of the squirrel species that we have here in Missouri, which are the Eastern gray and the box squirrels, are regulated under the wildlife code of Missouri. And they're, they're treated as game animals. That means that there is a season on them. And during that season, they can be freely taken in accordance with regulation. And that's actually a good time to, to help uh, regulate squirrel populations is during the legal season. But there's also provision in the wildlife code that if there are damage causing squirrels, they can be shot or trapped out of season without a permit here in Missouri. So, you know, there is the possibility of, of, uh, of uh, taking legal measures to control them. Now, when we think of controlling squirrels, uh, adequate control generally falls into one of several areas. And the first area is exclusion. And that might be a situation where, uh, as the person who sent in this question related, where you put screening over plants or, or over bulbs, uh, you can also use exclusion to keep squirrels out of structures, off of power lines, those sorts of things. So that would be one way to, to help tackle that. Again, oftentimes it's not particularly aesthetically pleasing, but it can be quite effective. Another approach is to use uh, repellents. And there are a number of repellents that are available to, to use in gardens. These are typically based on, on either putrescent egg solids or on uh, extracts from hot peppers. And so they're, they're taste repellents. And in some cases, they're also uh, odor repellents. Uh, these do work. They have to be replaced frequently. And obviously, they're of limited value if you're trying to protect something that you're going to eat shortly after spraying the uh, repellent. So keep that in mind. But certainly, those are available. There are a number of different brand names on those. Uh, trapping is a way to address squirrel issues. They can be trapped in uh, uh, cage-type traps. Uh, typically, the effective baits, if you're going to use a cage-type trap, would be something like walnut nut meats or slices of oranges or apples or perhaps peanut butter. And uh, you know there are other types of traps available too, lethal traps, which are called body gripping traps. And they are not allowed in Missouri in sets on, on land, but they can be used on houses, you know, on the sides of houses, at least six feet or more above the ground. Uh, if you're gonna choose to use those, oftentimes it's best to work with a, a professional uh, who has experience in the use of these traps. And then the, the final way to address squirrels is to, to shoot them. And again, it, this can be done uh, as long as the uh, uh, Missouri Wildlife Code regulations are followed. Uh, there are also some benefits to, to uh, having something like an active dog that can help patrol the area. But again, squirrels tend to be a bit, uh, present in high enough populations that your dog can be at one side of the property and squirrels can be munching down your tomatoes on the other side of the property. So that's the, the general picture on, on uh, managing squirrels in the landscape. And uh, we do have a, a link, and I'm not sure I can't see the chat if it's been dropped into the chat, but the Missouri Department of Conservation has a nice guide sheet on managing nuisance squirrels. So that's the story on squirrels. Uh, the next question that came in, Mr. Patrick, I used, Mr. Patrick, yes. I'm sorry, this is ask question here. Um, definitely this is an interesting topic. I received two questions. One question from uh, Ms. Kathy, maybe you can also see from the chat box. Um, can you address the question, armadillo? I guess. Oh, armadillos. Um, so, <laughs> um, in many of the same approaches that work with squirrels can work with armadillos, uh, particularly the exclusion. Uh, armadillos are somewhat resistant to to electrified fences. I know that farmers oftentimes will use electrified fences to uh, keep armadillos out of production fields but they can be, a, a, quite frankly, a very damaging animal in the landscape. Uh, I have to confess, I don't know the specifics on the wildlife code related to armadillos. They are not originally native to Missouri, although they're widely found in Missouri. Uh, Missouri Department of Conservation does have a guide sheet on armadillo management, and perhaps uh, we can hunt that down and drop that into the chat before the end of our, our uh, time together today. But yes, indeed, Kathy, armadillos can be damaging in, in the garden. Um, the second question is through the private message to me. Uh, is it illegal to poison gar garden pests like a groundhog currently living off our veggie garden? 
I think that the topic of, of um, lethal management has to be carefully considered and has to be done in accordance with Missouri Department of Conservation regulations. So uh, I'll refer you to those regulations for more details. Certainly there are ways to poison wildlife, nuisance wildlife, but it has to be done in accordance with the wildlife code. Okay, do we have any other questions on squirrels or nuisance wildlife? Thank you, all set. Thank you. The next question that came in, I used raised beds for my vegetable garden that require frequent watering because they dry out quickly. Is there a recommended mulch I could use for the beds that will help hold in moisture? Uh, raised beds offer lots of advantages for gardeners, particularly vegetable gardeners, but the reality is that the raised bed does tend to dry out more quickly than uh, uh, gardens that are grown in, in the uh, surface. And especially dealing with situations uh, such as Tony described where we're having dry spells, it's important to, first of all, set up raised beds so they can be watered, but also to use that raised bed in such a way that you conserve moisture. And mulches are an excellent way to do that. Now, when using mulches in a raised bed that is gonna be used for producing vegetables, we have to think about the cycling of vegetables through that bed. And oftentimes this means that it can be a challenge to use mulches that are more or less permanent mulches. So things such as bark chips, uh, stones, woven landscape fabric, those sorts of things. It's not that they can't be used, but it can be more of a challenge. Frequently in raised bed vegetable gardens, gardeners are using mulches that will in time decay and decompose and become part of the soil in the bed. So this means that frequently things such as straw, hay, uh, pine needles, or compost are used in, uh, in raised beds to help, again, provide the benefits of the mulch. Now, we, we uh, are, are fortunate today that we have a video that was produced by Ramon Arancibia, who is a horticulture field specialist, in Western Missouri. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring that up and we'll We'll play that video and it does a really nice job of going through the different types of mulches that are available for gardeners. So let's go ahead and bring that up here. Okay, Kathy, can we see the, uh, let me see if this video comes up. I'm not seeing it. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to have to I tell you what, while we're waiting on this, I'll wrestle with this. Uh, Kathy, do you mind to, to cover the, uh, the uh, uh, next uh, question, which was related to repotting houseplants and moving houseplants outside? Yes, happy to. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. Looks good. Okay, uh, so uh, now many of you may have already moved your houseplants outside. Um, I have not. I live uh, in the Northwest region and we are still getting um, not so much cool temperatures at night, that kind of ended this week, but strong winds. So uh, if you uh, have moved them out or you are just starting to move them out, I think this information will be helpful. Yeah, you want to do full screen for slides? Okay, just one second. Something's blocking that on my, um, uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, I say be patient because we're anxious. If you can see, this is my dining room and there's still room for a little table, but um, um, you got to be patient. Wait until those nighttime temperatures are 55 to 60 or above. So mid-May uh, is generally a pretty safe time. Once you do move them out, acclimate them by moving them into a shaded area and protected from wind and heavy rains. Uh, also protect them from the sun because too much sun too fast can cause leaf burns. 
And um, then you can just gradually move them to more sunny locations. A lot of my house plants can't take full sun. Uh, most of my house plants won't take the full sun um, during the season at all. So they're all always going to be a little shaded. Um, make sure that um, uh, as the plants uh, adjust to the new location, the leaves may lighten in color or the plant may go through some changes, but once they adjust, they'll, they'll return to normal or they should. Uh, fertilize once they're acclimated to the new environment. And anytime a plant is moved, it may need an, an acclimation period, mine do. Um, I've had fig trees almost completely lose all their leaves um, only to you know, leaf back out. Uh, plants will need more water. Remember this, they'll need more water when they're outside. So don't overwater. Um, so if you haven't moved them outside, look for new growth and start fertilizing if you see any. Clean up and trim dead leaves, no more than a third of the plant. Uh, get ready, uh, get the space ready for outside. That's something you can do if you uh, if it's still too windy or cool out. And consider if your plants need repotting. And um, when plants are root bound, they do need to be repotted. And there's several signs to look for. Um, does the potting mix dry out really quick? Are the roots growing through the drainage hole? That's a really good sign. Uh, does the plant seem to have stopped growing even after fertilizing? So if you answer yes to any of those, um, check the roots, see if they're circling around the pot, or if the root mass is so dense, you can't see any potting soil, it's time to repot. It would This plant, as you can see, it was very, very much time to repot it, but it was doing well blooming. But, uh, and all, and you know, some plants have different requirements. Some like to be root bound to bloom or uh, in airplane pants to put off the little babies. But generally you can follow this rule, these uh, questions. Spring is the time to repot. It gives the actively growing roots time to grow into the new medium. Um, you don't want to go up too large, however, in container size. So one or two inches. I don't, I don't like going up one inch. It doesn't quite seem enough. Um, so go up about two inches. Um, determine what pot, uh, plastic or clay. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Plastic is lighter weight and might not need to be watered as often, but clay tends to help pull the water and the salts out of the soil. So that's good for reducing the salt buildup and for people that tend to overwater. Before you repot in a, in a container, make sure you clean it. That's very important. And um, use I use a 10% bleach solution, 10% bleach to 90% uh, water. You also want to choose a good potting mix, not a potting soil, but a potting mix. So it's a soilless mix. It contains combination of organic matter like peat moss and then inorganic matter like uh, vermiculite or perlite. Um, so before you get ready to repot, water the plant and wait about an hour before repotting. That's a good time to clean up any foliage. Um, and then once you take the plant out of the container, gently break up any of the uh, root bound pots, any of the um, circling roots. And again, you wanna get that container that's uh, just uh, uh, a little bit larger. And one of the reasons for that is if you get to, if you put a small plant like this, if I put that plant in a large pot, it would uh, uh, lead to root rot because the roots would have a hard time um, finding that water. Um, again, the plastic or the uh, 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 care, the clay uh, depends on, you know, your preference or uh, the plastic is much lighter. Um, so you want to put a little soil in the bottom when you get ready to replant, maybe about a fourth of the container, and then place the, the plant in the soil, fill it around the edges and firm up the potting mix to give it good contact with the roots. And so there isn't much settling. You do want to leave about an inch gap between the top of the potting mix and the uh, top of the container for watering and plant growth. And then you place the plant and water. And I believe that is, that's all I have on that. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Happy for any questions. 
I will say I just repotted my ponderosa lemon and my kumquat, and I could almost watch those plants stretching out their roots <laughs> into that new soil. Yes, <laughs> they do that. <laughs> Were you able to get the video? Yes. Um, if Great. we don't have any questions for Kathy, or if you do, please drop them into the chat. Uh, let's go ahead and return to the previous question. And we have a video from Ramon Arancibia talks about different types of mulches, their advantages and disadvantages. So uh, let's go ahead and play the video. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of different kinds of mulches. I'm Ramon Arancibia, horticulture specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. This picture shows you the two most common type of mulches that are used in landscaping as well as in specialty crop production. A wood chips is a very natural organic mulch used in landscapes and plastic mulches, black plastic mulches is the most common one used in specialty crop production. There are several types of materials used in mulches. Stones are used in landscaping. Organic or biodegradable mulches are also used in landscape, but as well as in production of specialty crops or vegetables in the garden or in, in commercial production. Wood, chips, compost, straw or hay, cover crops that are killed for a mulch, paper, and nowadays the more advanced type of films that are compostable or biodegradable films. And the traditional type of plastic, polyethylene plastic that are non-biodegradable. They have an additive to protect them against photodegradation. Many of all are coming with this type of plastic which affect the soil temperature. There are some that are wavelength selective, means that some light is absorbed by the plastic and some light pass through to warm up the soil directly. And there are these uh, woven fabrics or ground covers that last, they're very thick and last for a long time, but they are water perme permeable too. So stones are mainly used in landscape for aesthetic purposes, but also are used to reduce evaporation from the soil in a xerophytic situation, or when you have few plants in your landscape. They usually use when you don't have irrigation or water is very scarce. It can be used in combination with a weed barrier beneath the stones. So good control of weeds and no irrigation is a low maintenance type of mulch. So the wood chips are also used as aesthetic in landscaping. They can be composted or non-composted, but the main reason to use wood chip is that it adds organic matter to the soil, so improve the characteristic of the soil. It retains moisture and is a good control, weed control system when the thickness is enough. It depends on the thickness of the or amount of mulch that you put in the ground. It is by itself or in combination with a weed barrier beneath for low maintenance. The thing is uh, this type of organic uh, mulches decompose or degrade so you have to replenish once in a while every year or after a crop for the next crop. It's also a very well used mulch in a production or in the landscape. It adds organic matter to the soil. It's a good weed control system depending on, on the thickness or the amount that you put. And it adds nutrients to the soil for the plant to grow, to use. It's susceptible to degradation, so it has to be replenished frequently. And the source is important to know that it's a reputable source because of food safety issues. It needs to meet the temperature requirements in the process, as well as uh, sometimes comes with a uh, plant soil borne diseases that may affect your soil if it's not if it has not meet the temperatures to kill those diseases. Straw or hay are also good organic mulches. They are good weed control systems depending on the thickness of the layer. They conserve water by reducing evaporation from the soil, add organic matter to the soil. But if there are grasses, they may tie up certain nutrients that uh, will not be available for the plant. So you have to overcome that by fertilizing. It also cools or maintains the soil cool in the spring because it avoids solar radiation to heat the soil to warm it up. And when you use in combination with a plastic mulch or ground cover, improves the weed control. Cover crops are also used as much in commercial production of vegetable crops or in your garden. They have the same benefits as straw or hay. When it's as a legume in the cover crop, after you kill it, it adds nitrogen to the soil. Uh, it's used in conservational tillage in production, in commercial production, but it requires appropriate equipment 
like rollers or crimpers like you see in the bottom pictures to kill the cover crop and use it as a mulch. Or it has to be killed chemically with herbicides. And then for planting, you need also a special, a special equipment to plant in a no-till system. If you're gonna plant by hand, it's gonna be a little more difficult to plant. Film mulches are the most commonly used in commercial production and sometimes in the garden too. The organic for, uh, films nowadays are the newer type of uh, plastic mulches. They have the characteristic of being biodegradable. So that's a, a very good advantage of using this type of plastic mulches. But it has the same, this, the same characteristic in uh, modifying soil temperature depending on the color, conserve water, control weeds as polyethylene plastic films. Other, other advantages is depending on the color, it repels or attracts insects. Uh, it decreases root pruning because you don't have to uh, till the ground where the roots are. The plastic will protect that. Uh, reduce fertilizer lesion and localized erosion due to heavy rains. And there, in the case of woven uh, ground covers, they're very durable, they last many years. And one of the important things of using plastic mulches is that increase yield. However, you have to consider the additional expenses and labor to uh, put it down as well as removing it. Cellulose starch or paper mulch are also used in the garden for weed control. And because they're biodegradable, they're well accepted. Depend, the weed control also depends on the level of degradation. The more it degrades, the more exposed the soil, less control of the weeds. And also they have the problem of that expand or contracts depending on the moisture or when it rains and then dry it out, which produce that the paper will reap and that allows weeds to come out. Also because of this situation, they have a poor soil contact. So the transfer of energy to warm up the soil is inefficient. In relation to plastic film, color is important. Some colors will increase the soil temperature especially the transparent one or black, although they have to be in good contact with the soil to transfer the energy, or wavelength selective type of mulches, they will warm up the soil efficiently. Other ones that will maintain the, the cool soil are the white plastic or the silver reflective because they reflect the solar radiation and the soil stays cooler. Other effect of the color of the plastic is that they repel or attracts insects. The yellow color will attract insects. The silver reflective type of mulches will repel insects. And we have the woven type of uh, ground covers. They are very thick, very durable for several years. They're water permeable. They can black or white, and they can be used in high tunnels or greenhouse or in the field as you can see in these pictures. They're good weed barriers especially for landscape, but also in production, as you see in these uh, pictures. However, plastic mulches, polyethylene plastic mulches have problems about disposal and with environmental concerns. When they, they photodegrade, they produce microplastic, which are an environmental concern. And also when, because they have this additive that uh, protects them against photodegradation, they last a very, very long time. They can be recycled, but it's not economically feasible. Also, they can be burned for fuel, but it's not allowed in many states and it's not economically efficient either. And with this, we finish this presentation. I hope this information will be useful for you to select the appropriate type of mulch for your garden. Thank you. Well, very good. Well, uh, again, Ramon, thank you for preparing the, uh, the video for us. Uh, if you have any questions related to mulches, feel free to drop them into the chat or send them on to the garden hour at a, at a later point. Um, I don't, I've been kind of watching the chat. I don't think that I've seen any uh, any questions. So let's move on to our, our next question. Actually, <laughs> this is uh, Pong Tian, who manages the plant diagnostic clinic at the University of Missouri. And uh, he's the person that you want on your team when plants are sick. And Pong, uh, you'll be covering I see sick plants. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's time to look at the sick plants. Welcome to the new series of the Garni Hour I see sick plants here. So this is the uh, photos I received this week. 
uh, it is from a client uh, the um, with the uh, problems on his uh, yield plant. You can tell from the two photos, uh, there are some holes all, uh, uh, all along the trunk. And uh, in some way you can tell they are uh, in the single line, but uh, each line is like a parallel with each other. So here is what the client said. The U branches with holes, boards, have yellow leaves. You can definitely tell this plant is stressed. Next to the U bush, a maple tree was treated with systemic insecticide last year for borrow beetle disease. So this is what you see from the outside of the tree. If you look inside on the trunk, you can definitely see the holes. So my question would be, uh, what could be the cause? And uh, this is the photo was shared by my Missouri Department of Conservation colleague. She had the same problem on her pine tree. And you can see those holes all along the trunk. So here are the, uh, I'm gonna uh, ask our, uh, yeah, the, the polls can, you can start select. I give everyone maybe seven more seconds. Okay. Looks like we are having, uh, oh, maybe someone needs some time. Okay. Looks like we have a winner. Share the results. So we have the top candidate is a bird's damage. The second is a beetle's damage. You guys are great. So now let me stop this one, close this one. It is birds damage. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the, um, um, the uh, woodpecker and a sapsucker damage. So there's a misconception that woodpecker or sapsucker only look for insects. Sometimes the, uh, sometime the bird will uh, work on the plant relentlessly just for a uh, sap. Let me return to the same spot and work on that. The holes may get larger and larger and deeper and deeper. In some way, we consider the damage are minor, but in some critical situation, it may damage the entire tree and keep declining the, um, the tree and uh, it may cause the tree death. So uh, this, is the, this is not beetles because uh, the major difference is that uh, the holes will be in a single line in a really good order. Um, there are definitely some uh, information about how to control the damage. Uh, I will share a link in the chat box. If you have any question, uh, please um, uh, email me uh, or uh, send a, a photos to our plant clinic uh, email address. Uh, that's all I have today. You guys are doing great. Thank you. Thank you, Pong. Um... Manoj, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, we have some questions. Uh, Hong, uh, can you tackle this? Uh, so Scott has a question, what is borer beetle disease? You briefly mentioned about the borer beetle disease on maple. Yes, so I think it, uh, I think Scott had two questions. The first, what is a borer beetle? It's called an amb ambushore. I, I hope so, I hope I can pronounce it. Uh, and Borsio uh, beetle, which is a really severe beetle disease for a broad range of trees. It is, an, this beetle is not a, uh, the embryo ash borer. The embryo ash borer, also called EAB disease, it is uh, uh, transmitted by, the, um, by, the, um, by this insect and can, they are host specific, only attack the ash tree. So if you have EAB disease, it will not infect maple or oak. It will primarily working on the, on the elm tree. I have another question. I have a silver maple with gall. They are red. Any thoughts, should I spray or, or leave? Uh, normally the gall will be a reaction or response for plants to a certain factor such as insect damage, chemical damage, or bacteria infection. Um, I will need to look at the photo uh, to see what type of gall it is, uh, where the gall 
um, present. Sometimes the gall are on the leaf, sometimes the gall on branch, some, sometimes you may see a big gall on the, on the trunk. So I would have more than happy to take a look at the photo, Joe. So if you can send me an email, plantclinic at missouri.edu, uh, I would be uh, willing to look at it. You don't need to spray anything so far before we have a further uh, conclusion about that. I hope I address your question. Yeah, there there's was another question as well. I don't want to miss that. Uh, it's about corn. I guess uh, client is asking about sweet corn. What parasite, bug, pest, or disease can be on corn as it grows? Uh, what time the host con corn or you're talking about conch? Corn. Corn? Yeah, maybe this like, is about sweet corn. Oh, sweet corn. Um, I believe the sweet corn we just planted. I is he asked for some disease problem for corn. The question is what parasite, bug, pest, or disease? Just in what, general. What is a par parasite in general? For the sweet corn, the disease will be similar with the row crop corn. Uh, they have leaves, uh, foliar disease, uh, rural disease, and also have stem disease. I would be more careful for the potential insect damage and a foliar disease through the season. But so far, since the weather is really dry, I don't see any disease reported for, for corn so far. But uh, uh, keep scouting for disease and uh, uh, let us know. Okay, very good, very good. Well, on the uh, the vein of pest issues, uh, the next question came in was concerning Japanese beetles. And uh, Manoj Chetri, who is a horticulture field specialist in Northwest Missouri, is going to tackle that. So Manoj. Yep, I hope you can see my screen all right. Uh, I don't think it's, yeah, there we go. Okay, so. Yeah, well, Japanese beetles, I think everybody knows what it is. Um, so there's a plethora of uh, Japanese beetles we have seen, right, last years and actually last few years here in Missouri and in the neighboring states. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this and see what we have coming this summer. Um, and I want to spend some time talking about the life cycle of Japanese beetles so that we can know what it's all about. So generally, this is a good map to look at. Um, may not be exactly what we have in Missouri, but it's a very good reference point to understand how does Japanese beetles grow. And they are annual, they actually just have one generation uh, per year. So every time they come out uh, uh, from the new eggs. Uh, so the adult, they emerge uh, sometime in early to mid June in Missouri. Um, and uh, once they emerge, they have a, they live up to 60 days, anywhere from 45 to 60 days. And that's where we are seeing the damage on our, uh, all kinds of um, ornamentals and trees and shrubs, vines, you just name it, right? Uh, you can see everywhere those in the middle of uh, summer. Uh, and once uh, they complete the life cycles, they, they lay eggs and then those eggs are gonna hatch out in mid July to August. And after those uh, new caterpillars are hatched out, they pass through several stages uh, until uh, in the fall time. And then they go slowly as the winter um, comes in, they slowly goes deep down into the soil and um, over winter underneath the soil uh, adds grubs, what we call them. And again, throughout the winter, they will stay there as overwintering grubs. And now coming next spring, they will slowly go bigger and uh, start feeding uh, on your um, underneath uh, the grass. They are root pruners for sure. They like to uh, feed on roots and crowns and rhizomes. And as temperature starts to warm up in the springtime, and they will pupate. And that is the final resting stage. And they are now ready to emerge into adults from pupa in early to mid-June, and that's how the life cycle is completed. Yeah. Now, having, having known that the whole complete life cycle, um, now we can understand what will be the, our management strategies for Japanese beetles, right? And just uh, if you do not know, 
then the larva we, we got the Japanese beetles we call them grubs or white grubs they are white is in color uh, yellow head uh, they have three pairs of legs and if you touch them or disturb them they'll just crawl and become like a c-shaped creatures and they are um they are right now we can find those grubs if you have um work in your garden then you have found those also on your on your lawn you can find them if you dig them up um, and now in the early to mid June, when they will start converting from that grubs to adults, right? The adults June beetles, sorry, adults Japanese beetles, uh, they have metallic green green color. Uh, their body size is about um, no, about a half a half inch or a quarter inch long, um, green in color, of course. But uh, the the wings are coppery brown wings and that's how we can distinguish these uh, Japanese beetles from other similar beetles. They affect in fact a wide range of species more than 300 plant species uh, they can uh, feed on those um, trees like linden, elm, crab, apple, sycamore these are the common ones. Um, your fruit crops right grapes, plum, cherry, blueberries, vegetable crops, uh, your row crops, soybeans, corn, all kinds of crops that uh, they can feed on and lawns. And the lawns, uh, only these uh, caterpillars or grubs are the one that's damaging. Adults do not feed on lawns, but all, all for, for the rest of the crops, your adults are the damaging stage. Uh, what happens with these Japanese beetles, as you might know, is uh, once you see a uh, few, they start aggregating in, a, in, a, in a quite a number, right? Because they produce a hormone or pheromones and so that attracts male and females both in the same feeding location. So oftentimes you can see in a group of 20, 25 feeding out of a small space because of that pheromones. And because of that, the chances of mating and chances of producing this massive number of offsprings uh, next season is huge because of these um, pheromones attraction as well. Now, when we see the um, swim with the Japanese beetles uh, eat these uh, or feeds on the leaves. Uh, they have a very typical symptoms, which we call skeletonized leaf or window pane in general. But what happens is they are only feeding on the top epidermis and this middle mesophyll tissue, what we call, but the bottom lower surface of the leaf is uh, not damaged and the veins are also not damaged. And so we can see the typical symptoms from, as uh, we can, is very typical and unique uh, from other insects damage. And that's actually how we distinguish the damage from Japanese beetles um, versus rest. Now, how do we manage this? Um, again, when we talk about insects management, we talk about IPM, right? In integrated pest management. So there are three big components from that, cultural, physical, and chemical management strategy. The so cultural is the big one for, for homeowners, actually. So culture is basically doing the good practice your good fertilizers, irrigations, mulching, the all good practice that we need to grow healthy uh, bushes and trees and our vegetable crops, all those uh, that, that has to be done uh, because once you have these healthy growing uh, trees and bushes and crops, then you can manage or you can tolerate uh, the damage from Japanese beetles uh, much better uh, than, than going with other uh, control options. For example, your mature trees, they can tolerate the damage and you don't have to do anything if you have a Japanese beetle damage. Uh, if it is one or two years old tree, then they may not um, be able to tolerate the damage, but the, but the healthy mature trees that has been well irrigated, fertilized and mulched and can actually tolerate the damage. Uh, some of you might be tempted to use the um, pheromone traps that are available in the market, but uh, we do not recommend that because it's just asking for more problems by inviting more and more insects uh, or, or beetles. And also they might actually first go and feed on their crop and then end up in the trap. So that's not very effective strategy. Uh, the matter of fact is for the homeowners, the best strategy, it might sound a little bit dreadful and grime, but the hand picking of those beetles will be the best strategy. Uh, if you can start early, the better, right? If you start the earlier, the better, uh, because their numbers are low. If you wait too long, then might not be, might not work well, but you have to be very active or proactive and then uh, scout those um, regularly under garden um, in the early June and start hand picking them, use a soap solution or some insecticides or even alcohols and drop those on that bucket or jar 
um, by hand picking you can manage pretty much every sing every other day or three or four times a week would be a best strategy to go and do that if you have a small area if it is a big a yard or garden might be, not be a very effective strategy um, the insecticide options right after doing all those cultural and physical methods then you can use contact insecticides and um, several insecticides available in the market will work uh, pyrethroid based insecticides that's very common um, some examples are cypermethrin um, cyclothrin bifenthrin these are the, some of the common uh, pyrethroid based insecticides and others, um, imidacloprid is also one of the uh, that you can find in the garden stores. Malatoin is another one. And neem oil is also would also work. This is an organic based uh, insecticide. Uh, it will just smother the uh, the outer exoskeleton, and and the insect will succumb to death because of that application. So all of these things has to be implemented um, together, uh, and have to have you have to have a broad plan not just the one uh, plan to manage the Japanese beetles effective. So watch out for those um, in the early July. That's all for the Japanese beetles from my side, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions that came into the chat? Let's take a quick look. We do. Uh, we do. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is one. Yes. So I see a white grub worms when I dig up turf in my lawn. Are most of these grub worms the larva of Japanese beetles? Or are they larvae for other insects too? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are other, the caterpillars of insects or beetles, generally we call them grubs. But for the Japanese beetles babies, we call them white grubs. White grubs, uh, the one I showed in the picture with uh, white body, yellow head, and, six, and three pairs of legs. That's the one from Japanese beetles. There are other grubs, and some of them are, they do not have legs, which we can call them legless grubs, right? Those are from different insects. These are from um, billbox, actually. So that's different. But if you see, um, you know, those type of grubs with legs, uh, three legs, then that's probably most likely from Japanese beetles. Yeah, that's all for that question. I think we lost Patrick. Yeah, well, okay. thank you. Oh, no. oh I'm back. I'm okay. back. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, we're, the clock is ticking. We have just a few minutes, and um, I'm going to do my best to talk just a little bit about asparagus since we're in the asparagus season right now. So let me uh, bring up that presentation. Okay, can we see that, Kathy? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Well, asparagus harvest is underway. It's a fabulous uh, vegetable crop. But it is important to know when to start and when to stop as far as harvest. So a couple of general thoughts. Uh, the yield you'll have this year depends on how well you took care of your patch last year. And so good care will definitely lead to a, a nice yield the following year. Do You don't want to over harvest, and especially when uh, plantings are young. Uh, typically, we want to wait till the second year after planting crowns before we start harvesting an asparagus planting. And then the yield will continue to build over, over a few years uh, after that, and then you'll be reaching full yield by about the time of year four or five. So um, how much can you expect from a mature planting? About 46 to 57 pounds per thousand square feet of bed would be considered to be a good asparagus yield. Now, how do you harvest asparagus? Generally, it's best to snap the spears rather than cutting them off with a knife or a pair of pruners. Uh, if you reach down with your hand, grasp the spears near the ground level and bend them, they will snap at the point where they're tender and there won't be any fibrous area there at the base of the asparagus shoot. So you can eat the whole thing. Now, when should you harvest? Uh, first of all, you want to harvest while the spear tips are tight. You can see that in this picture here. Typically, that's going to be uh, 
when the uh, spares are about, oh, maybe seven to nine inches early in the season and then five to seven inches later on. You don't want to wait too long as the weather warms because the spears grow very quickly and they can lose quality if you don't harvest them when they're smaller. Now, when should you harvest? Uh, generally best to harvest in the morning. This is the point where the spears have the, the highest moisture content. They'll be uh, of best quality at that point. And especially as the temperatures warm, you're going to be harvesting at least every two to three days. And in fact, uh, as the uh, weather gets warm, you may be harvesting every day. The spears grow that quickly. What about spring frost and asparagus? Well, the spring frosts won't hurt the crowns or subsequent harvests, but they will damage any spears that are above ground at that point. So if there's a frost predict to go out the night before and harvest all of the spears, regardless of size that are above the soil. Keep in mind that once you've harvested your asparagus, it has a relatively short shelf life. So cool it immediately, put it into the refrigerator at 36 degrees to maintain quality, and then enjoy that asparagus as quickly as you can. If you want uh, dates, in, uh, depending on where you are in Missouri, your harvest season is going to run roughly from April 10th to uh, sometimes toward the end of May or early June. But a good signal of when to stop is when the uh, diameter of the spears are less than the diameter of a pencil. At that point, stop harvest and let the plants grow to fern. Okay, that is a quick introduction to uh, asparagus. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, in the uh, Garden Hour. And Kathy, back to you. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Well, I think that's our time today. Please join us next week, the 17th at noon. We look forward to seeing everyone. We'll have another great program. All right. Well done, everyone. High five. <laughs>